industry study preliminary version for the timber products and furniture industry. <coughs> Excuse me. Today we're looking at industrial relations, entry level training requirements and roles of industry personnel. You specifically need to look at career opportunities and working conditions and also look at various roles and requirements that people might have within a business. So industrial relations, let's start here. Industrial relations is about people and organisations and their ability to work together within society and within the political systems of our society. Employment takes a huge part of our lives. For example, I reckon I spend around about a third of my life working. A third of it sleeping, a third of it working, a third of it doing whatever I want. And so employment then determines our living standards because it controls how much money we make and all of those sorts of things. So industrial relations helps to determine our living conditions in a, in a sense because it determines our employment conditions and the amount of money we make and the environment we work in, those sorts of things. In 2006, the federal government introduced some work choices legislation that basically said we need to tighten up the laws in Australia to make sure that every employer is given consistent rights around the industries. And so they started the New South Wales State Award System in 2010 uh, which basically meant that everyone has the same employment standards and there are a set of employment standards here that we'll go through. For starters, these are written based on a full-time employee. They can be translated to part-time employers. Part-time employers work a part of a full-time week, so you get percentages of all of the things you're going to hear about here. So if you work half a full-time week, you get half of the available entitlements that we're going to go through here. To start with, a full-timer should work no more than a maximum of 38 hours per week on average, okay? plus any reasonable overtime, okay? but 38 hours is the maximum working week. They have the right to request flexible working arrangements, particularly if they've got young children, children with a disability, um, or other sorts of issues that would impact on their ability to fulfil their responsibilities at work. They're entitled to unpaid leave for their children, so taking some time off to spend time raising your children. Uh, particularly, you would be familiar with this idea of maternity leave, but the terminology has been uh, recently updated to parental leave because it can be used by either the mother or the father uh, of the child. And the idea is you get 12 months to raise that child in its first year of life. Now it is unpaid leave, okay? not paid leave, but you have the right to 12 months time off work where your job is guaranteed when you come back. Additionally, you're entitled to holidays. We call that annual leave, four weeks of it per year. So again, if you're part-time, you're only working half of a week, uh, then you would get two weeks per year. You're also entitled to sick days. So when you're sick, you should be able to call your boss and say, hey, I'm not feeling well today, I'm not coming to work, and you're entitled to be paid for up to 10 of those per year. Again, this is for full-time workers. When we talk casual workers, casual workers are not entitled to paid days, however they are still entitled to unpaid leave days. You're entitled to community service leave, which is where you get time off to help with emergency activities, uh, jury duty, things like that. The example that I'll give here is you may remember the Queensland floods uh, possibly around about five to ten years ago now, and there was a massive cleanup effort and they were asking for volunteers from all the states to come up and help shovel the mud out of people's houses so they can get back to living. If you were volunteering, volunteering for those sorts of emergency activities, you're entitled for up to 10 days of leave, unpaid so that you can go and help out in those areas. You're also entitled to long service leave. So to reward you for staying with the company for a long period of time, then you are entitled to be paid additional holidays after 10 years. And additionally to that, public holidays, you're entitled to have the day off. And if it's a day that you would normally work, you're entitled to be paid on that day as well. Some companies may be open on public holidays, they might ask you to work, but you're expected to be paid at the double time rate for that. As part of that as well, you're entitled to be told if you're being terminated and you're going to use, lose your job. So your employer must give you a period of four weeks notice if they're going to terminate your employment. They cannot just fire you on the spot, except in really exceptional circumstances. And lastly, they need to give you this information, this fair work information statement where they give you these 10 national employment standards. They need to give you that piece of paper when you start your employment so that you are aware of what you're entitled to. 
So that's the first big change the government has in terms of industrial relations that impacts people's work. The second big thing that impacts people's work, and this is particularly on how to get a job, your employment opportunities, is the Equal Employment Opportunities legislation. Now in the Equal Employment Opportunity legislation, it basically says that all workplaces need to be free from discrimination. It means that workplace policies and procedures need to be fair and should not disadvantage people based on age, gender, social or orientation, sexual orientation, disabilities, etc. There should be no discrimination whatsoever. And employees, while they have the, uh, they have the ability to not be discriminated, they also have a responsibility not to discriminate. So it's a reciprocal relationship that happens. You have the right to not be discriminated against, but you have the responsibility not to discriminate against anyone else. If you were discriminating against someone, you would be in breach of this law. Additionally, discrimination. There is an Anti-Discrimination Act. Okay, so two pieces of legislation now the government has put in to stop you being discriminated against. When we talk about equal employment opportunities, we're talking about when you're attempting to get employed or attempting to get a promotion in your employment, you're not discriminated against. That's illegal. When we're talking generic anti-discrimination law, we're talking about it doesn't matter what part of your job or even if it's outside of your job, you should not be discriminated against. That is against the law. Again, these are the reasons uh, that are considered to be discrimination. These are the reasons that people are commonly discriminated against. But these are the things that you cannot discriminate against people for because you would be in breach of the law. The age, sex, if you're pregnant, if you're disabled uh, or have a disability, your race, your colour, your religion, your marital status, your res responsibility to look after children, uh, your sexual orientation, doesn't matter. You cannot discriminate based on any of those things. So that's the end of sort of government legislation on some impacts. Now let's talk about your training requirements. How to actually get a job. Let's now talk about how to actually get a job in the timber industry. There's a couple of ways, and I'm going to start at a very top level. Not many people would do this, but you can go to university, complete a degree in manufacturing products, walking into a white collar role. It's very unlikely that someone producing furniture in a regular uh, ma and pa, sole trader sort of business would be walking in with a formal university qualification. It is more likely they would be using a TED course. So a certificate three or a certificate four, for example, in furniture making, in CNC machining, in finishing techniques, in whatever it might be, French polishing. These training courses are nationally recognized. They can be translated across uh, industries. It makes sure that you have training with up-to-date equipment and machinery in and you have first-hand experience in the industry. Now, these are, these are what you're probably familiar with as trade courses like construction, plumbing, electrical. Same sort of courses, but not necessarily requiring a license. So you would still do apprenticeships and learn the skills on the job, okay, uh, without having to go to university. You can also do apprenticeships. You don't have to do apprenticeship, but there is the option to do apprenticeship. And you can also just go out and start a business. There's nothing stopping you from doing that. You can use your experience from school in furniture making to just start a business. And because there are no licensing requirements around the timber products and furniture industry, there's nothing stopping you from doing that. However, statistically speaking, if you just do that, you're more likely to have a business fail within the first three years because you don't have the formal qualifications required to get this done. So there you've got it. A real quick overview of industrial relations and the government legislation, government policies and procedures that impact on the industry. And additionally, uh, we've spoken about some of the different ways that you can get a job. There's a couple of questions here. You can see this one comes up quite a lot in the HSC. I would recommend you have a look at the one in the box there on government legislation and how it's changed the work that's getting done.